see the family it is so good to be with you god it has been so good to us uh, this year 2020 has definitely been an up and down challenging year for a lot of us uh, but despite all that uh, god blessed us to see another day and for that we should be thankful and we should be joyful and we should be excited about god's goodness and what he is doing in our lives things that we may not be ready for things that he is planning for us that we don't know about. God is so good. So you have to give him praise in all things. And I just hope and pray that God will be blessing you this holiday season and blessing your families and blessing uh, this church and that it continues to do the work of the kingdom. Shall we humbly Go to God in prayer at this time. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for this opportunity to render sacrifices of praise, render sacrifices of adoration unto you for who you are, how you bless us, how you keep us, how you sustain our lives. We love you, God. We know, God, that you are doing mighty things in this world today, things that have never been done before, but we put our trust and we put our hope and we put our faith in you and things that we have no control over and things that we want to know. God, we know that we have to put our faith in you and allow you to work in our lives and allow our faith to be evident in what we do and who we are and how we respond to each and everything that comes at us in life. Help us, God, on our journeys. Help us to understand our purpose. Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Lord, the people praise you. Lord, the people praise you. We lift you up and raise you. Lift you up oh, and Lord, you. you are the Holy One. Place nobody above you. Place nobody oh above God, you. cause you are the Holy One. You are the Holy My Lord, Lord, you're the one, you're the only one. The one the and only we're singing one. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. All the glory is due. Yeah. 
bless you as you command.
so because God oh my God is my As we continue with our worship, please join us in prayer. Lord, we come before you today to give you honor and praise. You are worthy of our praise. You are the source of all that is good. You are the source of all of our blessings. Forgive us for our sins and cleanse our hearts of sinful thoughts and intent as we enter into your presence with praise. Lord, we give thanks for every gift that we have been given, for helping us to accomplish our work week, and for your plans for us this week, for Jesus and the sacrifice he made on the cross to save us, and for the gift of your spirit to guide us, for the opportunity of being together this day. We ask for your hand of blessing on this assembly. Lord, we pray on behalf of people who have lost, who are lost and are in need of you, of members who are sick or weak, and those who need help from you, of families who have suffered the loss of a loved one. Lord, we request of you to give us strength to serve you. Give us more knowledge about you. Grant your presence today and guide and direct our worship so that it is full of wisdom, reverence of your presence, and respect for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is now time for communion. We ask that whatever emblems you are using to represent the bread and the wine, that you hold it in your hand at this time. We understand in Matthew 26 and 26, Jesus took bread, broke it, and blessed it. That bread is representative of our covenant, our fellowship with one another. We ask that the bread is unleavened without any wickedness or malice. We understand that we're virtual, virtual at this time, but yet and still, we have ways to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. We ask that you bow as we bless the bread. Heavenly Father, allow us to take this communion with clean hands and pure heart. We ask that our fellowship be in align with your will, dear Lord. Bless the bread that we may partake at this time. In your son's name we pray, amen. In the same manner, Matthew 26 and 27, Jesus took the cup and said, drink ye all of it. That cup is representative of his blood, which is the forgiveness of sins. Jesus died on the cross on our behalf and his blood cleanses our sins. Let us pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing your son to die on our behalf and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Continue to guide us and watch over us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh, to Jesus.
We now prepare to worship our Lord through our giving. Just as in communion, our giving involves two kinds of responses. Our first response is an acknowledgement of the income that God has provided us to meet our daily needs. By faith, we return to him a just representation of the regular income, which is called the tithe. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in meeting our daily needs and for giving us the power to gain wealth. We acknowledge your faithfulness to us by our giving of the tithe and for the support of this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The blood that Jesus shed for me
I want to welcome you to this another online service of the Receda Boulevard Church of Christ in which we are fulfilling our mission of bringing life to the world. We have just completed a series of messages uh, that was designed for this pandemic entitled uh, Faith That Works in Difficult Times. We want to prepare now to give you a new series of messages that we've entitled The Countdown to a New Beginning. And the aim of this series is to enable you to prepare for the coming year as a new start. It is a time to make renewed commitments of faith, to reestablish your priorities. We're going to be emphasizing uh, and challenging you with faith commitments, family commitments, fellowship commitments, and even financial commitments uh, that will enable you to experience uh, what is intended to be a new beginning. Now, we are in the context of a holiday season called Christmas. Uh, the focus of the nation is going to be on the birth narrative of Christ, the birth of our Savior, uh, and Christians. Uh, keep in mind, you know, we, we are not commanded to celebrate Christmas. There are no rituals that we have been given for a perpetual celebration, you know, of the birth of Christ because the gospel stories does not center in the birth of Christ, but it centers in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, without which the birth narrative would be irrelevant. So the celebration of Christmas is not discouraged, but let me say this, it is an important focus, you know, in the gospel stories. It's important because uh, this season is important because it confronts us, you know, with critical questions. Uh, Throughout these stories, we are confronted with critical questions that has to do, you know, with our destiny as human beings. Now, the Christmas, the Christmas season is providential, is providentially situated. Actually, it ushers us into the new year. And that's appropriate because uh, the new year signifies new beginnings. And of course, you know, the birth narrative is about a new beginning. The creation provides us, you know, with life cycles such as constant reminders, new opportunities. Everything goes in cycles, 365 days, and then we have what is called a new year. 24 hours, we have a new day. You know, so everything about the creation is designed, you know, to provide opportunities, to be reminded opportunities for new uh, for new beginnings and to have a new start, you know, and that's what the birth story is about, is about a new start, it's about a new beginning. And of course, the focus on the birth stories confronts us over and over again with questions that determine human destiny. You know, when you talk about, you know, the quality of your life, let me tell you that the quality of your life and your destiny is largely determined by the questions you ask yourself. And the bolder and the more honest the questions are, uh, the greater quality you're going to experience in terms of life and the further you're going to go in terms of your destiny. Now, the messages that we're going to uh, utilize in developing this special countdown you know, to the new beginning. It's literally going to come out, you know, of the Christmas story. It's going to be questions that relate to human destiny, questions that you cannot avoid, you know, if you're going to embrace, you know, the purpose and plan of God for your life. There are five critical questions that comes out of the birth narrative that we're going to use in terms of these, me these messages. The first question uh, was raised to Mary. You know, we're going to talk about Mary's question uh, in Luke chapter one, verses 26 to 55. And then we're going to deal with the question Joseph, you know, had to uh, answer uh, in Luke, in Matthew chapter one, 18, 24, uh, chapter two, verses 19 to 21. Then we'll deal with the shepherd's question in Luke chapter two, verses eight to 20. And then the question of the wise men, you know, that's raised in that story, Matthew chapter two, verses one you know, to 21. And then the final question that we'll deal with, you know, on the first on the first Sunday of the new year will be the innkeeper's question, which is Luke chapter two, verses one to seven. 
Now, I want you to know that these are critical questions because how you answer these questions will have everything to do, you know, with your destiny, because that's what the birth, the birth story is about, is about Christ, you know, intervening, Christ coming into this world, you know, for a specific purpose and uh, to answer ultimate questions. Uh, and we are confronted with those questions in the birth narrative. Now, today's focus is going to be Mary's question of chapter one in the book of Luke. Before I deal with the question that Mary had to answer, which is also a question that you and I, you know, are confronted with, I want to first deal with, you know, misconceptions about Mary, you know, and that is you need to distinguish between truth and tradition. You know, Mary was not perfect, number one. Secondly, she was not sinless, number two. And thirdly, she was not God. Nowhere in scripture are we told to pray to her or to worship her, you know, because that's simply a church tradition. As a matter of fact, it's an unbiblical, you know, tradition. It undermines certain teachings, you know, concerning uh, divinity, concerning the Godhead. But the point is, you need to understand that there was something very special about her, and we need to know what made her special. And what made Mary special was that she was willing to accept God's plan for her life and what she was called to do. Now, we want to look at the story of Mary that's told in chapter 1, verses 26 to 29 first, because the angel shows up in her life, you know, and tells her an incredible, uh, an incredible plan that God had made for her. Notice uh, in this text, it says, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a town a town in Galilee to a virgin engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to Mary, greetings, uh, you uh, who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting uh, this might be. Now, quite naturally, uh, this we need to understand that Mary was a very young young teenager at this time. In ancient times, marriages were arranged uh, and people married, women married at a very early age. It, it, it was traditional for a young girl age 12 could be engaged to be married at age 13, simply because lifespans at that time was very short. A person's lifespan was no more than 31 or 32 years. They could die of some disease, you know, during that time. And so Mary is, Mary is a very young, a young woman, uh, and her marriage had been arranged, and the angel shows up with an incredible, an incredible story. You know, now, I want you to uh, listen to this story as we look at verses uh, 30 to 33. The angel says, do not be afraid, Mary. You have you have found favor with God. You will be with a child and give birth to a son and you are going to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, quite naturally, this is a this is an incredible story. He's telling Mary, he said, look, you're going to have a child uh, and you're not going to have sex. Uh, and that child is going to be a very special child. Now, notice, you know, this was very troubling, you know, to Mary. Uh, she didn't know what to think what to say, who to tell. She couldn't tell her mama. She couldn't tell her community. She couldn't tell Joseph. She was very troubled. Can you imagine receiving, you know, this? And then the angel lets her know this is not going to be something ordinary. This is going to be very unordinary. This is not going to be an ordinary birth. It's going to be an unordinary birth. It's not going to be an ordinary child. It's going to be an unordinary child. You know, so Mary was troubled, you know, by it. And she quite naturally had other questions that needed answers. So notice uh, in verses 34 to 37, she asked some questions. She said, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that so the Holy One will be born uh, to be born will be called the son of God. 
Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she is in her sixth month. So nothing is impossible, you know, with God. Now, you can see that God is the angel is giving her some consolation because he knows the predicament she's in. He's letting her know this is not ordinary. It's not an ordinary birth. It's not an ordinary child. And all the terms that's used in the text are actually code terms for the Messiah. You're going to be giving birth, you know, to the Messiah. And then he provides us, he provides her with some form, you know, of consolation. And that is, he's letting her know you have an aunt. Her name is Elizabeth. You know, she's a, she's, she's been a barren woman, uh, not able to have children, but she's going to experience a miraculous birth. You know, she's going to give birth to a son as well. And of course, we know that uh, that was John the Baptist. And what Mary does, you know, in as much as she don't have anybody that she could really talk to about this situation, she goes and stays with, she goes to Elizabeth's house and lives with her for a few months. Now, the question becomes, why did God choose Mary? Uh, because it certainly wasn't because of her education. You know, she was she was virtually, you know, a young teenager. It was not because of her wealth. She was a peasant. You know, it was not because of her maturity, you know, but God chose her because she trusted God completely and was willing to accept God's future with extreme consequence and extreme cost. You know, I want you to note Mary's response in verse 38. Mary responded to the angel saying, I am the Lord's servant and I am willing. Now, I want you to underline that because here is the key. You know, in other words, the question of Mary is, are you willing to accept God's plan and God's destiny for your life? And notice Mary's response is, I am willing, you know, to accept whatever he wants. I'm willing to accept God's destiny for me, is what she's saying. And may everything you have said come true. And the angel left. Now, the question becomes, why, you know, did she say yes to this uh, in spite of her fears, in spite of doubts, in spite of questions, in, in spite of the challenges that she was going to face. You know, she said yes, you know, to this plan. Now, uh, the answer to this question is in the fact that she wrote a song. This young lady wrote a song, a poem, uh, that has become one of the greatest pieces of poetry in history. It is called the Magnific Magnificat. You know, it reveals five reasons she accepted God's plan, you know, for her life. And it also reveals why you and I should be willing to embrace God's plan. And why God's plan is better than any plan that we can devise on our own or that anyone else can devise for us. So in this great poetic piece called the Magnificat of Mary, uh, a, a poem that many operas have been conducted, you know, around this. Thousands of songs have been written, you know, based upon these 10 verses, you know, in Luke, you know, that Mary wrote in terms of this this poetic piece, you know, and she revealed the five reasons why she accepted God's plan, you know, for her future and why God's plan for our future is better than anything we can devise on our own is better than any plan that anybody else can devise for, our, for, for us. You know, so here are the five reasons that we're going to give, you know, for uh, why God's plan is a better plan. Mary says this. God's plan is better because God made me for his purpose. In other words, you were God's idea. You were God's invention, God's product. He formed, he designed, he crafted, he constructed you, you know, for his purpose. But yet in spite of his plan, understand this, you know, he does not force it on us. You know, we can choose our own way. Therefore, he saves us. Many times we rather than choose God's plan for our lives, we find ourselves choosing our and devising our own path. And therefore, he provides salvation. And what is salvation intended to do? To redeem us back to his purpose, to redeem us and introduce us to God's plan and destiny, you know, for our lives. Notice what Mary says in verses 46 and, for, and verse 47. Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices 
in God, my savior. So what she is saying is she followed and embraced God's plan with eagerness and not reluctance. She believed that this plan was the best plan for her. Now, many times Christians will respond to God's plan, you know, by accepting forgiveness. But we seem to be we are often reluctant to actually follow his plan for our life and for our destiny. You know, we want forgiveness, but then we want to go our own way. But notice God did not put you on earth, you know, without a purpose to live for yourself or to waste your life. God put you here, you know, with a spirit with a plan and destiny in man. And you can choose your own way or you can choose to go God's way. So here's the second reason that Mary gives for accepting God's plan, you know, for life. And that is because no one cares, no one care for me more than God. In other words, he cares about your life more than you do. Unlike, unlike that song, uh, that the songwriter Willie Nelson, you know, wrote that song that Willie Nelson wrote, you know, when he says this, he says, look, uh, uh, maybe I, I didn't hang around. He said, maybe I wasn't always there. He said, but you were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Willie Nelson, you know, but let me tell you, there's one word for that. And that is baloney. In other words, uh, you are not always, you know, on, uh, our, you're not always on one's mind. Let me tell you, only God, you know, God is the person that always is always thinking, you know, about you. And let me tell you, you know, when you say maybe I didn't hang around, you know, but you were always on my mind. That's just not true, because if you aren't there when she needs you or in tough times, you know, it doesn't matter. You are not thinking about her. Now, let me say this. You know, we love our family. I love my family. I love my children. I love my wife. But let me tell you something. They are not always on my mind. The point is my love for my family is not perfect love. But God, God's love is perfect love. You are always on God's mind. He never stops thinking about you. In Psalms 115 and verse 12, the Bible said the Lord is constantly thinking about us and he will surely bless us. Let me tell you something. God watches everything that concerns you. In first Peter five and verse seven, the Bible says, uh, give God all your worries and cares for he is always thinking about you. Now, let me tell you something. Whatever concerns me, whatever, whatever gets me uptight, whatever makes me afraid, it concerns God. You know, that was you may remember uh, the guy by the name of Bill O'Reilly was on the Fox channel you know, with what is called the O'Reilly Factor. And he would sign that program off with the spin uh, by saying, with the sign off saying the spin stops here. And then he had a final tag off line uh, that says, because we are, all, we are looking out for you. Well, let me tell you, that's not true. But God is always looking out for me. Bill O'Reilly wasn't, wasn't looking out for me. He didn't even know me. But God does. God knows me and he's always looking out for me. Mary accepted God's destiny because she knew that God was looking out for her, uh, her destiny. In other words, uh, her destiny would have problems. It would be tough. That would be criticism. She knew that, you know, but he would always be mindful. Notice in chapter one of Luke, verse 48, you know, uh, it says, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. That's what Mary says. He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Circle the word mindful because it means that he's alert, that he's attentive, that he's aware, that he's focused, that he's paying attention. You know, God is mindful. You may raise the question, to what extent, you know, is God attentive you know, to us. This is expressed in Matthew chapter 10, where the Bible says, the Lord says, not even a little sparrow can fall to the ground without your father noticing it. The very hairs on your head are numbered. You know, so the point is that God's plan and God's destiny for us is always best, you know, first of all, because 
God made us for his purpose. And secondly, because no one cares for me more than he does. And then thirdly, because it is the key to blessing. Do you not know the key to God's blessing is to go with God's plan for your life? He isn't going to bless your own plan. You know, if you ignore God's plan and you go off, you know, wanting to do your own thing, he you are literally on your own. God is not going to bless your plan. He's going to bless you when you coincide or when you follow after what how uh, what and how he has made you. You know, Mary knew that faith and obedience was the key. You know, that's why she said in verses 48 and 48 to 50, she said, from now on, every generation will call me blessed for he. The mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. And God will show his mercy to every generation who will worship and serve him. Now, she is saying uh, that God is going to do what God is going to do for me. She said is never going to be forgotten. You know, now this was not just Mary's destiny. Note that the text says it's for every generation. You know, everything that you do for the Lord is going to be remembered for eternity. You know, Mary could understand this, that Mary could have rejected God's destiny for her. Why? Because God gave us free will and love only is associated with free will. Love can only operate out of the capacity of freedom. You know, so therefore, uh, we are free to embrace or to reject. So she followed him because she loved him. In other words, we follow him because of love. We aren't uh, a marionette or a puppet on a string. You know, God didn't design us that way. And anytime you embrace some idea of sovereignty that makes you like a puppet, you're just you're just playing out what God has already designed and planned and this, that, and the other, and you have no, you know, you know, you have no choice in it. That is a false teaching. It denies, you know, the teachings of scripture as it relates to the sovereignty of human being. You know, the fact is that most people miss their destiny by choosing their own plan, you know, instead of God's plan. Mary could have missed hers. You know, notice in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19, the Bible says this, this day I have set before you life or death, blessings or cursing. Now choose life so you and your children may live. You know, we have a choice, friends. We can choose God's plan for our lives or we can choose to go on our own and experience the curses associated with that. You know, some members uh, choose, will choose to sit out this process, you know, of the, the process of the countdown. And, and they don't want to participate in in renewing their commitments and making faith commitments and even making, you know, financial commitments that enables them to experience the realness of God. And that's our purpose as ministers and church leaders to challenge you as believers to experience your faith, to provide you with the principles, you know, and steps to experience the power of faith and the realness of God. And that's what we're going to be doing, you know, during the process of the next next few weeks. So don't sit it out. You know, God didn't bring you to the church for you to sit and just watch other people being blessed. God wants you, you know, to experience the fullness of life that he promises in Christ Jesus. James says in James 4, verse 17, say, remember you to know what to do, what you ought to do and don't do it. It is a sin, you know, so understand that God's God's plan for your life is better, you know, because it is the key to blessing. Here's the fourth reason and that Mary gives, and that is because God honors humility. Do you not know it takes humility to say, God, I'm going to follow your plan and your way and not mine, because pride and arrogance says the very opposite of that. Notice in chapter one and verse 15, 53, you know, uh, Mary says he has displayed his power with many mighty deeds, but has scattered the people who are proud and think they are the great ones. He has brought down mighty rulers uh, from their thrones, but has raised up the humble. He has Feel the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away with nothing. You know, that is called the great uh, reversal. And this is a great piece of poetry. That was a story uh, not long ago of a young teenager named Taylor Swift who wrote 
uh, her first poem at the age of 10. And by the age of 14, you know, she was being paid by the Sony Corporation, you know, to write songs, you know. But I want you to know that the greatest teenage songwriter that ever lived was Mary. Because in these 10 verses, she mentions 17 different attributes of God and then strings together 10 verses of the Old Testament for memory. And so we can see that God chose her because she knew his word. She memorized it and she meditated on it. You know, this young lady knew the word of God. Now, the Bible teaches us that before honor, before honor comes. Is humility. Humility comes before honor. The Bible said, humble yourself before the Lord that in due season he will lift you up. You know, in other words, if you want God to honor you and and certainly we're presenting this series of messages because I want God to honor you in in this next in this decade. I want God to honor your family. I want God to honor your business. I want God to honor your 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 life. I want him to honor your health. You know, but it all starts, you know, with humility. Here is the fifth reason why God's plan is better than any plan that you can devise for yourself. You know, Mary gives us, and that is because God keeps his promises. You know, that's the big theme of this poem, you know, is the faithfulness of God, that God is faithful and he can be counted on to keep his promises. Notice what she does uh, in verses 54 and, and verse 55. She rehearses a promise to Abraham made over 2000 years ago from her time. That is from this time, a promise that was made 4000 years ago. You know, she says that he has kept his promise he made to our ancestors. You know, and that is the promise of the Messiah and has come to the help of his servant Israel. He has he has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all of his descendants forever. You know, so she is reciting the promises of God and she is saying that God is faithful because he keeps his promises. Her story begins. Notice this story. You know, the story of Mary. It didn't begin, you know, at that time. Uh, her story begun long before Mary was ever born. God had already devised a plan, you know, for Mary's life. You back in Isaiah chapter seven, uh, the Bible said, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That is, he predicted this. This is a thousand years ago. He says, and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, so the story of Mo, the story, story, the story of Mary's life, just like the story of your life, it began in the mind of God, you know, before you were ever born. Now, the point is, are you going to embrace God's plan, you know, for your life or are you going to reject it? Here's the summary. In other words, we ask you to do three things after every message. And that is, first of all, to apply the principles of the message that is. Embrace God's plan because, number one, he made you for his purpose. Number two, because no one cares more about you than God. And then number three, because it is the key to being blessed. And then number four, because God honors humility. And then number five, because God keeps his promises. And then what I want you to do is participate in the countdown to a new beginning by making faith commitments. There are three things that we're going to be asking you to do, and you're going to be seeing and hearing more about this as as we move toward forward in this countdown. First, make a tithing commitment of anticipation. What we mean when you when you plan, you know, to give in the coming year, when you're planning to tithe, don't you don't tithe based upon what God has done in the past. You tithe what you anticipate. It's a faith commitment. You anticipate what God is going to be giving you, you know, as your regular income, you know, for the future. Look what God, look how God grew your life over the past year and then make a faith commitment of anticipation. This is what I am anticipating making this year and start tithing on that. You know, that is what enables you to experience the realness of God. Do you not know that tithing is designed to be proof of God? You know, now notice the second commitment is to give a special offering. We're going to, you know, to be doing some great and bold things as a congregation in terms of expanding the ministry of this church and the mission of this church. You know, and we want you to give a special offering. We'll be letting you know more about this. But notice offerings are according to your faith. 
You know, that is, it's an expectation of divine abundance. And it's like God giving you a blank check. You know, he's saying, you know, if you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. That's that's about offerings. It's not about tithing. It's about offering. And so you have the opportunity to write your own check as it relates to your prosperity. That's what offerings are. And so we're challenging you as we approach this countdown to give a to plan to give a special offering according to your faith. And that is an expectation of divine abundance. And you're going to based and based on that, you're going to give a special offering. The third thing that we want you to do is pray for three friends or family members to come to Christ on or before we return to the assembly. We want you to begin to experience the fact that God is preparing you for his purpose. God is preparing you to be his witness and you have to be willing and committed you know, and active in terms of responding to that purpose that God has in your life. And that is for you to be an instrument of life, to carry life to others. And all we're asking you to do and what we're asking you to do is simply to pray for three friends or family members to come to Christ before we return, you know, to the assembly on or before we return to the assembly. We'll be giving you more specificity about that. You know, so in conclusion, let me say, if you have not yet began, you know, to embrace God's destiny for your life. Let me tell you, let me let me encourage you to take these four steps. Number one, admit your need, you know, to embrace a new plan and admit your need, you know, for salvation and then accept Jesus Christ as your savior. That's called repentance. You're not going to rely upon your own anymore. You're going to recognize that his plan is better and best for your life. And then the third principle is acknowledge the savior as God. You know, Jesus is son of God. He's going to be the new uh, manager of your life. And you need to acknowledge that he's going to be directing your path you know, toward the destiny that God has for you in the future. And then act on his command. Your faith must be active. Do, the only faith that God honors is faith that obeys. So you must act on the command, you know, to receive his forgiveness and to belong to his body. If you're willing to do that, friends, you know, then you are on the road. You know, you have established, you know, the premise upon which you, you know, can begin experiencing a new divinely ordained future, you know, for your life. Will you pray with me? God, we're so grateful for who you are. And we're grateful, Father, for uh, the fact that you order our steps, that you, uh, if we through faith are willing to follow after you, you'll lead us to life and the experience of life more abundantly. Father, we pray that there are those who are under the sound of my voice, you know, will heed this advice and heed this encouragement to accept the plan that you have devised for them and to accept it with eagerness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.